He was a healer, a doctor, a philosopher, a religious scholar, a biographer of Jesus, and an organ player who performed for the King of Spain. This is the incredible life of Albert Schweitzer. We are not used to philosophers who take their own thoughts seriously. Arguments are cheap. Most philosophy papers published get read by a handful of people. Essentially, philosophers can write what they want and nobody cares. Whole careers are made on the strength of papers that mean nothing to anyone. Those who publish useful philosophy, those whose thought can be applied, are often looked upon with suspicion. But these others have always existed. From Socrates to Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, there have always been philosophers who had wanted to make a difference in the world, who wanted to be read, discussed and followed, who wanted their ideas to live, who wanted to change their societies, who wanted to make the world a better, fairer and more just place. Albert Schweitzer was one of them. He was a medical doctor, Protestant theologian, musician and philosopher. In many ways, he was a son of his time, a contemporary to many others who seem larger than life. He was born right between Gandhi, who was six years older, and that other Albert, the physicist Einstein, four years his younger. It was an age whose protagonists built and destroyed empires, erected cathedrals of science and dedicated their lives to almost inhuman levels of altruism. And they did all that over lifetimes that included the two most terrible and inhuman wars that history has ever seen. Thinking back to the world they inhabited and formed, one is reminded of the great line in the script to Graham Greene's Third Man, where Harry Lyme says, well, What the fellow said, in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias they had warfare, terror, murder and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. In Switzerland they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Albert Schweitzer is not much remembered today. His legacy is not carried forward by an army of scientists or a whole nation of a billion people. Philosophers never took him seriously as an ethicist. Although few who call themselves ethicists today would be willing to put their whole lives in the service of their beliefs as he did. As a young man, he studied theology and music becoming an expert in the study and restoration of historic church organs. He was such an accomplished musician that in 1905 he was invited to play for the King and Queen of Spain. After the concert, the King asked him, Is it difficult to play the organ? To which Schweitzer answered, It's almost as difficult as it is to rule Spain. As a scholar, he wrote two books on the interpretation of Bach's music. He published widely acclaimed research on the historical Jesus and, much later, on the mysticism of early Christianity. But as he grew older, he also grew restless. Unsatisfied with a life of privilege, as we would say now, asking himself, how he could justify his existence in the face of Jesus' commandments. To a friend, he wrote, For me, religion means to be human, plainly human, in the sense in which Jesus was. In the colonies, things are pretty hopeless and comfortless. We think only of what we can get out of the natives. In short, what is happening there is a mockery of humanity and Christianity. We must send out there men who will do good in the name of Jesus, men who will help the distressed as they must be helped. 
if the Sermon on the Mount and the words of Jesus are valid and right. Schweitzer continues, Now we sit here and study theology, and then compete for the best ecclesiastical posts, write thick learned books in order to become professors of theology, and what is going on out there, where the honor and the name of Jesus are at stake, does not concern us at all. I cannot do so. For years I have turned these matters over in my mind this way and that. At last it became clear to me that this is not my life. I want to be a simple human being, doing something small in the spirit of Jesus. We might today dislike some of Schweitzer's word choices, but this was over a hundred years ago, and Schweitzer was just using the language of his time. More important is that, at this early stage already, Schweitzer felt that we should be grateful for life. Nobody can know, he said, where we came from or where we were going. The only sure thing was existence itself. And the only way to affirm life was to take responsibility for our existence. Much later, Schweitzer's young cousin, born around the time Schweitzer wrote these words, Jean-Paul Sartre, would make existence the central theme of his philosophy. But for Sartre, this meant futility and distress, not thankfulness. The word existentialist could be applied to both, but it was Sartre's version, not Schweitzer's, that gained currency in the philosophical world. Three years later, Schweitzer finished his medical studies. Already teaching theology at the university, he had become a student again at 30, ten years older than his peers. And in the time left to him, he was an organist of rising international reputation. As his biographer remarks, his biggest problem at that time, among the studying and teaching and writing and playing music, was to stay awake. But slowly he was approaching his dream of spending his life in a more meaningful way. In 1913 he set out on a boat to Africa. It was in Africa where Schweitzer founded his hospital with his own money at Lambareni in what is now Gabon. It was the work in Africa that brought into sharp focus for him the difference between one's rationality and one's emotions. Schweitzer writes, I was always, even as a boy, engrossed in the philosophical problem of the relation between emotion and reason. Certain truths originate in feeling, others in the mind. Those truths that come from our emotions are of a moral kind. Compassion, kindness, forgiveness, love for our neighbor. Reason, on the other hand, teaches us the truths that come from reflection. Schweitzer continues, But with the great spirits of our world, feeling is always paramount. The truth of emotion is the most profound and the most important truth. One day, Schweitzer had to take a long journey up the river that passed by his hospital. Lost in thought, he sat on the deck of the barge, struggling to find something common in all the ethics that mankind uses. Two days passed. Late on the third day, at sunset, they were making their way. Just then, it flashed through his mind that one phrase that would define his own philosophy. Reverence for life. Schweitzer writes, The iron door had finally yielded. The path in the thicket had become visible. Now I had found my way to the principle in which affirmation of the world and ethics are joined together. Later he would summarize his philosophy in this passage 
from civilization and ethics. Ethics is nothing other than reverence for life. Reverence for life affords me my fundamental principle of morality, namely that good consists in maintaining, assisting and enhancing life. And to destroy, to harm or to hinder life is evil. Reverence is not the best translation. The German word Schweizer used is Ehrfurcht, a composite of Ehre, meaning honor, and Furcht, meaning fear. Ehrfurcht is the awe and fear we experience in the presence of the sublime, in the presence of God. Like his contemporary Albert Einstein, Schweitzer too agreed with Spinoza that God is not some being that resides far away on a cloud and judges mankind. Instead, Schweitzer's God, like Einstein's and Spinoza's, is one who cannot be separated from the world. God is the world. Einstein said, I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. Schweitzer lived his life according to the idea that God manifests himself in every form of life. His co-workers at his hospital would remember him carefully picking up and placing little earthworms and spiders to the side before planting a sapling into the ground. And if God is equally present in all life, then we cannot see human life as superior to other forms of life anymore. The essential moral element in all living things is life itself. The moment one begins to distinguish different qualities of life, one is on the path that leads, ultimately, to the misconception that animal life is more valuable than plant life, that human life is more valuable than animal life, and that perhaps even some human lives should be seen as more valuable than other human lives. And this Schweitzer was never going to accept. In the end, therefore, his view of things boils down to a very simple maxim. He wrote, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. Schweitzer was given the Nobel Peace Prize in 1952. He returned to Africa where he used the Nobel Prize money to expand his hospital in Lambarene. Shortly before he died, his daughter wrote in a letter. Lambarene Hospital is in a great degree an African village, which now comprises 72 buildings grouped around the central core, operating theater, x-ray room, laboratory, dental clinic, delivery room. About a thousand operations a year are performed, about 350 babies are born each year at the hospital. For Albert Schweitzer, Real philosophy is nothing without the reverence for life. Mm -hmm.